SpaceX's orbital launch site has been a flurry of activities recently with the ground support system and the launch tower additions. Starbase was not left behind in this action as there were reports of some engines firing up this week, and in spacecraft industry in general, it has also been quite dramatic a couple of weeks, with NASA hinting that there could once again be two companies selected for its human landing system. Most interesting in Starbase, SpaceX's construction site for the Starship is the impending orbital launch of the Starship 20. The Ship 20 is the first ship they designed to be fully orbital. All other Starships before this have only been launched just over the 10-kilometer mark. The Starship 20, together with its Super Heavy Booster 4, will create a Starship Super Heavy stack so large, the largest in the world even. Ship 20 also includes innovation that brings us closer to the release of fully reusable rockets, the first thermal protection system of ceramic heat shield tiles all over the windward side of the rocket. Much of the weight of the Super Heavy stack is in the Super Heavy Booster 4. This Goliath of a machine is 69 meters tall and is expected to launch the Starship well out of the atmosphere, with hopefully enough thrust to get it part of the way into orbit. Then it will separate from the second Starship stage, turn around and do the first test boost backburn. The Booster 4 will then make its way back to a designated target offshore, ignite its central engines one last time, and splash down gently with luck on target in the ocean. This sort of test run has only been done here with the Falcon 9 much smaller than the Super Heavy. To get ready for this first launch, SpaceX has been under pressure to prepare all of the ground systems equipment required leading to some pretty interesting events in the GSC tank farm and in the launch tower. Images secured by Boca Chica Gal and NASA Spaceflight show the first massive propellant tank arriving at the orbital tank farm with its little brother not so far behind. This has led to some interesting debate because it looks quite different from the set of eight massive GSE tanks we have already on the farm. The most interesting about the arrival of these two tanks is that they have been pre-manufactured. All other GS tanks prior to these were created by SpaceX with their own steel and manufacturing process, but these were pre-supplied and shipped into Starbase. Both tanks look like they are to hold methane, but their exact purpose at the orbital launch site we have yet to determine as Elon Musk is keeping that information on a need to know. The mere length of these tanks suggests that they will remain on their backs for a significant period of time. This gives no extra clue though as to its purpose. Are they simply extra storage tanks for methane, or are they part of an intermediate holding tank to enable rapid detanking? Following these deliveries, we see SpaceX roll out the cryo shells number 7 and 8, the last two remaining shells for the GSE tank farm, days between each other. A few hours after their delivery, cranes were attached and they were lifted into the air and brought down over their respective methane and liquid nitrogen tanks. With these tanks in place and ready, we inch closer to stage zero, the actual launch of Starship 20, assuming FAA gives its approval. Musk is confident, though, that if all goes well as it currently is, the first orbital launch could happen as early as November. Mechazilla, the orbital launch tower itself, is not left out of all the exciting new happenings. Pictures provided by Starship Gazer show the vision for Stage 0 of Mechazilla, and evidently the excitement is justifiable because this is no ordinary launch tower. The tower is to feature two massive catch arms that will allow both the Starship and the booster to be caught mid-flight right out of the air, and then restacked and ready for the next flight. The catch arms will also act like a typical crane, rendering actual cranes obsolete in future launch tower designs. It would seem that though newcomers in the space industry, SpaceX is truly on a course to showing its counterparts how design is done. In line with all this, all the skates for the carriage section to run up and down the tower rails have been installed. The cable chains that will feed power and hydraulics to the carriage and catching arms have also been installed. Then the crane to lift up the catching arms to the tower was aligned and hooked up with the tower. The arms were slightly lifted and ready for setting onto the tower, then hoisted up and attached to the tower in a matter of days. The plan for Mechazilla coming more and more into focus is shaping the near future up to be even more sci-fi than we could have ever imagined. And while all of this was going on, halfway across the country on suborbital Pad B, Starship 20's testing regime made a major leap forward. On Monday, the 22nd of October, Ship 20 survived its first static fire test involving propellants and Raptor engines. With just 20 minutes left in the day, the Starship passed its first pre-burner test involving both a single vacuum and a single sea level Raptor. The test was undoubtedly successful as soon after the engine was detanked and the road was immediately opened without any issues. Three days later, the ship underwent another successful static fire test using a single vacuum Raptor engine. 
the video of which was posted on SpaceX's official Twitter page. And though there were some effect to the ship as some of the heat tiles were noticeably missing, this is not a major issue for the orbital launch as Elon Musk stated that they expect some tiles to shake loose during the static fires, in reply to a question directed to him on Twitter. This is one of the many benefits of SpaceX's choice of stainless steel for the ship's body. A few missing heat tiles will not lead to catastrophic failure of the vehicle. And so, as far as the Starship's launch is concerned, it has been good news for SpaceX so far, and fingers crossed, it will continue to be so. In other news, the Senate Appropriations Committee has directed NASA to select another space agency to create an alternative human leader for missions to the moon. This is following protests by Blue Origin, as well as initially Dianetics, when NASA awarded SpaceX with funding for Starship Lunar Lander. This legal back and forth has been going on now for months, putting progress there on hold. NASA chose SpaceX to lead this project because their proposed solution fits well within the budget provided and met the goal better than the other options. This is not even a shocker considering the success of Elon Musk's other endeavors in comparison with his competitors in different sectors. Evidently, his counterparts in the space industry do not want Musk to have such a wide margin on them like is seen in the EV industry. What is very strange, though, is that the government has instructed NASA to sign two companies, but they have not provided the agency with enough funding for two separate successful lunar HLS projects. Funding was the core reason for NASA opting for the company for the project initially. Apparently, the Senate does not agree that NASA requires much more funding to have two systems running simultaneously. And while the tantrums and protests of Blue Origin were the major cause of all these delays, their company may end up not even being picked for the project. Their proposal did not meet any of the requirements stipulated by NASA, and their budget is not at all feasible considering how low government funding ended up being. And though it is all well and good to protest, one also still has to deliver effective solutions. Besides all that, let us just hope that everything soon unlocks so that SpaceX can continue development and they can select another company. Now, don't get it twisted. Having multiple systems running side by side on this project is a good one. But can this happen with the current budget proposed? And how do you think it will affect the quality of HLS delivered by the two selected agencies? Let us know what you think about this in the comments. Also, let us know your opinions on the impending launch of the Starship 20. Will it actually be done in one month? Will the needed FAA approval significantly affect progress, or is it likely to get sorted quickly?